The Capitalist Unconscious, uh, Marx and Lacan by Samuel Tomsek. This is part three of chapter two. Uh, chapter two is called The Capitalist Unconscious, A Return to Freud, and part three is called Lust Go In. Only four years after the publication of the interpretation of dreams, its lessons found a further development in the elaboration of the libidinal unconscious. In 1905, Freud published two apparently unrelated books, Jokes in the Relation to the Unconscious, and three essays on the theory of sexuality. While the book on jokes continues the direction of the interpretation of dreams, both method and style-wise, the three essays replace the reference to language with the body and the structural analysis of satisfaction with the theory of sexual development. The press welcomed the first book, while the discussion of sexuality encountered resistance and discontent. Despite apparent differences, the two works nevertheless meet in the introduction of the Freudian notion of jouissance. Condensed in the expression lust go in, pleasure gain or pleasure profit, in which it is not difficult to recognize the conceptual mediator between Lacan's surplus jouissance and Marx's surplus value. With this notion, Freud finally names the object of the unconscious production and the object that satisfies the unconscious tendency. Both works also intersect in that they introduce the tendency that will henceforth occupy Freud's theoretical work and call for the elaboration of a meta-psychology, the drive and its topological paradoxes. Lust go in and the move towards Tribler, the theory of the drive, overcame the opposition between structure and anatomy, situating psychoanalysis in the gray zone, their intersection. Freud thereby inaugurated the direction that Lacan came back to when defining the signifier as an apparatus of jouissance. Freud, from the very outset, approached the modus operandi of the mental apparatus through economic metaphors. As his theories became more complex, this economic reality too displayed its antagonistic features more and more, one of them being the tendency of the unconscious production towards the absolutization of the production of jouissance. Our mental activities, writes Freud in one of his later texts, pursue either a useful aim or an immediate pleasure gain. Again, in accordance with the distinction between use value and exchange value. The analysis of dreams has already shown that the satisfaction of desire does not address the issue or the use value of the day residues, but aims at the value of jouissance they obtain through the dream work, placing unconscious labor in equivocity with unconscious desire. The term lust go in defines pleasure as surplus, hence, as something that the mental activities reach beside their tendency to usefulness. Seen from the perspective of use value and of the need it presupposes, pleasure appears as an affection that accompanies the abolition of a bodily stimulus and the decrease of attention. From the viewpoint of value, however, pleasure is no longer a more or less accidental side effect but the object of satisfaction. As such, lust Gwyn does not relate to any quality, which also implies that it has no corresponding need. The shift from usefulness to uselessness that directs the Freudian concept of lust explains why Lacan translated the German term with jouissance and not pleasure. From the very outset, it is clear that a fundamental subversion is at stake in lust Gwyn which is not an insignificant side effect of satisfaction. The satisfaction of needs is always already paras par parasitized, colonized and subverted by the satisfaction of unconscious tendencies, desire and drive, whose existence depends on the autonomy of the signifier and of value. The connection of pleasure with use value, the definition of commodity as what satisfies a need and serves as a source of pleasure is also Marx's point of departure, 
where different types or qualities of needs are, are equated in the following way. The commodity is, first of all, an external object, a thing which through its qualities satisfies human needs of whatever kind. The nature of such needs, whether they arise, for example, from the stomach or from fantasy, makes no difference. Nor does it matter here how the object satisfies these needs, whether directly as a means of subsistence, i.e. an object of consumption, or indirectly as a means of production. Hasty psychoanalytic readings will, will conclude that Marx begins his analysis of commodity form by foreclosing the dimension of desire and hence of the subject, because he simply equates the immediate bodily needs and the needs that are symbolically mediated in the last instance rooted in fantasy, hence needs and desires in the strict sense. However, this is precisely what Marx does not do. By exposing the double character of commodities, he introduces the equivocity between both regimes of value and the tendencies of satisfaction, which will in the end relativize the non-phantasmatic status of need and use value. Marx introduces his developments with the claim that, in order to analyze the qualitative aspect of commodity, we first need to abolish the division of immediate and mediated satisfaction on the one hand, and physiological and psychological satisfaction on the other. The commodity form becomes the universal source of pleasure. In the modern universe, there are only commodity pleasures. There is, a, there is thus one single satisfaction, which is nevertheless internally complicated due to the split of commodity between qualities without matter and matter without qualities, to repeat Milner. If even fantasies are marked by use value, the inverse is no less true. Exchange value colonizes physiological or psychological needs. The complication envisaged by Marx is thus apparent. In order to understand any satisfaction whatsoever, one first needs to analyze the structure of commodity. A useless object such as a diamond is evidently fetishized, but this fetishist relation is accompanied by a phantasmatic need. Desire traverses the need and is supported by the phantasmatic screen of usefulness. The simultane simultaneity of the satisfaction of needs and the other satisfaction of desire and drive unveils the coupling of two heterogeneities in a unified object, one of the functions of fantasy being precisely to link the non-linkable. Through this phantasmatic link, the use value and the exchange value contaminate each other and make the object in question ser vertrecht, as Marx writes, complicated, fuzzy, and even insane. When Marx equates the physiological need, stomach, with the intellectual need, fantasy, he indicates that the need should not be understood as quasi-natural. With needs, we already entered the discursive field, and need cannot be exactly isolated from its dialectical relation with demand and desire. There are no innocent needs, the satisfaction of which would not be structurally determined. Going back to Freud, his distinction between usefulness and pleasure shows that the satisfaction of needs could only cause pleasure as a side effect, and that this side contains no pleasure, pleasure gain. Usefulness and need remain in the perspective of what Freud describes as the reduction of tension or the abolition of bodily affection, which still suggests that the mental apparatus contains an essentially self-regulatory tendency towards homeostasis, they are the Aristotelian right measure. In order to speak of pleasure gain, a third term must stand between need and satisfaction, discourse, social link, difference. There is no jouissance without discourse, and there is no other jouissance than a discursive one, Lacan emphasizes this in the aforementioned translation of exchange value with the value of jouissance. From the viewpoint of discourse, needs and their satisfactions are always already stained with the other satisfaction that is tied to the libidinal body and to the material materiality of the signifier. The concreteness of the object whose qualities are supposed to cause pleasure fades and what counts is only the abstract object, which finally inverses the relation between pleasure and tension. This is where the structure of the mental apparatus approaches the capitalist economic model. 
In the other satisfaction, tension is no longer reduced, but increased. The satisfaction of needs is of minor importance and is entirely integrated in the other satisfaction, as its internal, quasi-fictional moment. The unconscious tendency in the capitalist drive for self-valorization, first and foremost, demand a constant production of surplus and a constant growth in tension. This is one of the main features of the Freudian notion of the drive, which demands a thorough re-elaboration of the functioning of the mental apparatus and the abolition of the initial homeostasis model. The dialectic of value shows that use value relates to exchange value in a similar way as appearance to logic. Freud will come to an astonishingly similar conclusion. What is useful is itself, as is well known, only a circuitous path to pleasurable satisfaction. Dreams fall into this category whereby Freud reminds his reader that it would be wrong to consider dreaming an activity that merely concludes and resolves the day's preoccupations in a hallucinatory, performative way. That is the business of preconscious thought. Useful work of this kind is as remote from dreams as is any intention of conveying information to another person. Dreams minimize the usefulness and the referentiality of the signifier. Instead, they intensify its autonomy and causality. In this respect, capitalism too is an, is an eternal dream, or rather a perpetuated nightmare from which it appears impossible to wake up. Once desire and the drive enter the picture, every satisfaction of needs seems problematic. All the needs of speaking beings are contaminated by the fact of being involved in an, in an other satisfaction that they may not live up to. The commodity form is the privileged materialization of this distortion, and even when Marx discussed the developed form of this contamination, fictitious capital, or the creation of value out of value, M, M, becomes the rule of production. He nevertheless repeated the critical gesture from the first volume, according to which the self-engendering appearance of capital is grounded in the fetishist fantasy of direct overlapping of quality and value. Freud took, this, Freud, Freud took the same direction in his move beyond the pleasure principle, from the, from the homeostatic to the conflictual conception of the psychic apparatus, where jouissance appears to be de deprived of all referentiality and becomes its own subject. But it would be wrong to conclude that in the libidinal unconscious, the negative subject of the signifier is abolished that the unconscious laborer vanishes, or that the repressed unconscious tendency becomes its own productive laborer. This would be fetishization of jouissance, homologous, homologous to the fetishization of financial abstractions, or homolo homologous, homologous, homologous. I can't remember which it's supposed to be, whatever. Freud discovered in the production of pleasure gain a transformation of pleasure. No satisfaction of needs can produce pleasure as profit because the pleasure that accompanies the satisfaction of needs merely signals the reestablishment of the supposedly homeostatic order that turns out to be fictional from the viewpoint of the other satisfaction. The key word here is homeostasis, which Freud in 1905 still believed determined the overall functioning of the mental apparatus. Lusk Lust Gawain is the first sign that the homeostasis of the pleasure principle is mere fiction. Nevertheless, it demonstrates that no satisfaction of needs can produce more pleasure, just as no surplus value can logically follow from the circulation, CMC. Surplus jouissance, the connection of pleasure with profit-making, does not simply undermine the supposedly homeostatic character of the pleasure principle. It shows that the homeostasis is a necessary fiction, which structures and supports unconscious production, just as the imaginary achievement of worldview mechanisms consisted in providing an enclosed whole without cracks in its overall construction. Lustgewinn is Freud's first conceptual confrontation with what will later be situated beyond the pleasure principle, the compulsion to repeat, and what will introduce the psychoanalytic equivalent to the circulation, MCM. The introduction of Lustgewinn retroactively explained the status 
of pleasure and satisfaction in the interpretation of dreams, but it also complicates the matter because unconscious desire was replaced by the drive. In both cases, the surplus object functions differently. On the level of desire, it appears as lack, absence, and negativity. This appearance is linked to the metonomic structure, <coughs> which makes the object shift from one concrete embodiment to another. Wach oh fuck. Wachman intensively elaborated this logical articulation in the case of the collector and the miser. The structure of collection remains open because the object of collecting is not identical to the collected objects. No object is the object that would totalize the collection, thereby bringing about the satisfaction of desire. Another case is provided by Freud's dream analysis, where the reality of unconscious desire depends on the association of apparently disparate elements. Desire coincides with its own interpretation. The combination of the material from the day's remains and with the codification of its insistence. One way to meet the surplus is thus through the metonomic movement, where the encounter with the object always fails. No object is the object of desire, and consequently the surplus is always confronted in the form of a lack. For the unconscious desire, the surplus is never enough surplus. It cannot be associated with one object alone. It is only in relation to the drive that the surplus appears positive. Instead of the metonomic shifting and withdrawing of the object, the drive is structured through circulation and repetition. The paradoxes of the drive were not an unknown for Marx, whose manuscripts already contained the connection between the structure of the drive, the abstract nature of the general equivalent, and the production of surplus value. Money is therefore not only an object, but is the object of greed. Greed is such as a particular form of the drive, i.e. as distinct from the craving for a particular kind of wealth, e.g. for clothes, weapons, jewels, women, wine, etc., is possible only when general wealth, wealth as such, has become individualized in a particular thing, i.e. as soon as money is posited in its third quality. Money is therefore not only the object, but also the fountainhead of greed. The mania for possessions is possible without money, but greed itself is the product of a definite social development, not natural, as opposed to historical. The drive is intimately linked to the double status of the general equivalent, as a means of exchange and as a particular use value that totalizes the universe of objects. Unlike desire, whose object is not yet identified with a particular embodiment and therefore supports the structure of metonymy, the drive presupposes the paradox of concrete universality, what the general equivalent is supposed to be. The desire for the object, wealth, thus accumulates a collection of objects that embody value. It focuses on the objects of value and not on value as object. The drive, on the other hand, is fixated on the object, the general equivalent, which due to its paradoxical status, being both singular and universal, a commodity and a commodity, in which all commodities are reflected, supports the infinite, infinitization of satisfaction, <clears throat> which is to say its impossibility and endless perpetuation. The capitalist drive for self-valorization is an unsatisfiable demand to which no labor can live up to. Marx also made an important point when he detached the notion of the drive from its biological or physiological connotation he entirely conditioned it with the this, with this social existence of the general equivalent and with historical development. The capitalist drive is therefore not the only possible drive. There is something like a history of the drive, a historical transformation of fixations, which alters the social articulation of the drive together with the function of the general equivalent and the predominant mode of production. In Plato and Aristotle, the problem of the drive is indicated, although in the universe of antiqu antiquity, this problem was not the same as in the capitalist universe, where the mode of production is based on the math mathematization of surplus value and on the unleashing of the demand for self-valorization in the form of fictitious capital. The old spirit of usury is by far no embryonic form of the modern spirit of capitalism, even if both can be explained through the existence of the general equivalent. 
let us recall another crucial passage from the Grand Reese. Hunger is hunger, but the hunger gratified by cooked meat eaten with a knife and fork is a different hunger from that which bolts down raw meat with the aid of hand, nail, and tooth. Production thus produces not only the object, but also the manner of consumption, not only objectively, but also subjectively. Production thus creates the consumer. Production not only supplies a material for the need, but it also supplies a need for the material. Marx again aims at the historical and the social transformation of the drive, leaving no doubt that the placement of the drive at the intersection of presumably natural need and its cultural articulation can be considered a predecessor of the psychoanalytic notion, for the Freudian notion of the drive is not the hunger that swallows raw meat, but the hunger that reaches satisfaction through the montage of cooked meat, cutlery, and table manners. Indeed, Lacan brought this to a crucial point when he compared the drive to a surrealist collage, underlining that the montage of the heterogeneous elements contains a differentiation between the aim and the goal, so again between use value and exchange value. Let us now pass over to Freud's discovery of surplus jouissance in his analyses of jokes and humor. In Jokes in the Relation to the Unconscious, the production of surplus is discussed in the social context. Freud emphasizes that at the very beginning when he justifies the fact that after already writing on dreams and failed actions, he dedicated another scientific study to an apparently marginal and insignificant object. The scientific discussion of jokes can be justified by the fact that a new joke acts almost like an event of universal interest. A joke is never merely a joke. It is a social process. It codifies nothing less than the relation between the unconscious and the social link. Unlike dreams, which appear to be a private activity of the dreamer, and where the presence of social mechanisms is harder to demonstrate. After all, the functions of dreams is to preserve sleep, the withdrawal from the social. Jokes immediately point towards a social framework. They reveal the structure of social relations and the social economy of surplus jouissance. The matter is, of course, more complicated. It is not that the unconscious is more social in jokes than in dreams, and that one changes the register of the individual unconscious for the social unconscious. On the contrary, for Freud, dreams and jokes represent two cases of the same discursive condition. The discussion of jokes in respect shifts from the individual to the social. Instead, it demonstrates that the unconscious stands beyond the division between interiority and exteriority, individuality and society, private and public. If dreams revealed the inscription of the social link into the unconscious, jokes demonstrated demonstrate the manifestation of the unconscious in the social link, two sides of the causality of the signifier. The analysis of jokes is introduced with the note that their character is not linked to a specific thought, but to their form of expression, wording. The entire focus is on the role of equivocity, which actualizes the split between meaning and value. The efficiency of jokes depends on how Witzerbit, the unconscious labor in jokes, forms the word. Unconscious production is again directed by condensation and displacement, but in this case their combination reveals an economic paradox. Different joke techniques meet in a common strategy, which consists of the multiple use of the same material, the, re the recycling of the given. Equivocity, double meaning, or wordplay combines different contexts in the same product. The multiple use of the same material characterizes the non-metaphorical use of condensation. Play upon words is nothing other than a condensation without substitute formation. In this transformation of condensation, Freud enters the economic tendency towards saving. All these techniques are dominated by a tendency to compression, or rather to saving, it all seems to be a question of economy. In Hamlet's word, or in Hamlet's words, thrift, thrift, Horatio. From this perspective, the unconscious laborer appears as the ideal saver, whose tendency to condensation is supposed to produce a surplus. Save in order to create profit and to stabilize economic relations. Sounds rather familiar. The tendency towards saving is declared to be the general characteristic of joke techniques, 
although there is something economically inefficient in this form of saving, since the entire process is accompanied by displacement. In order to explain the apparent absurdity of unconscious saving, Freud recurs to the following economic comparison. The economies made by the joke technique do not greatly impress us. They may remind us, perhaps, of the way in which some housewives economize when they spend time and money on a journey to a distant market because vegetables are to be had there a few farthings cheaper. What does a joke save by its technique? The putting together of a few new words, which would mostly have emerged without any trouble. Instead of that, it has to take the trouble to search out the one word which covers the two thoughts. Indeed, it must often first transform one of the thoughts into an unusual form, which will provide a basis for its combination with the second thought. Would it not have been simpler, easier, and in fact more economical to have expressed the two thoughts as they happen to come, even if this involved no common form of expression? Is not the economy in words uttered more than balanced by the expenditure on intellectual effort? And who saves by that? Who gains by it? Saving turns into spending and the unconscious appears as an ideal consumer. The problem is that metonomic movement creates long detours and actualizes a tendency to spend. The combination of both operations, condensation and displacement, saving and spending, thus produces an apparent contradiction, an economic absurdity. Freud's analysis shows that jokes generate a loss in order to reach pleasure profit. The surplus is produced at the background of the interdependency between spending and saving, and the housewife metaphor is pertinent only insofar as it shows that saving should not be regarded as the ultimate goal of the process, but as something that can as well be considered a form of spending, a production of surplus that differs from what would be the accumulation of savings. The appearance of saving masks that there is a different kind of production in the background. Similarly, the imperative of economic cuts and restrictions is the inevitable flip side of the imperative to produce surplus. The housewife example shows that the profit should not be attributed to the housewife, but to the entire procedure. Economy can make profit because she is losing money in a seemingly rational economization. This structural operation is deployed in the social dimension of jokes. Jokes should not, after all, be described as pointless or aimless, since they have the unmistakable aim of evoking pleasure in their hearers. They cause pleasure, and this feature entails a shift from usefulness to uselessness. At this point, things complicate for the same reason as in dreams. The pleasure in jokes is reached through detour and at the background of the preceding renunciation of pleasure. If we do not require our mental apparatus at the moment for supplying one of our indispensable satisfactions, we allow it itself to work in the direction of pleasure and we seek to derive pleasure from its own activity. When the mental apparatus does not satisfy needs, it produces pleasure, but it is impossible to determine when one activity ceases and the other begins. Production needs to be associated with a problematic tendency which opens up three possibilities. Either the tendency is innocent, which is questionable in itself, why would it then be masked? Or jokes can serve either a hostile or an obscene tendency, aggression or exposure. The procedure is marked by a libidinal investment that points back to the drive. This new object of study in connection to unconscious formations and, one could say, a new metaphor of the capitalist, the unconscious investor that has now replaced desire. Desire did not know what it wanted and has metonomically shifted from one object, pick up, one object to another. The drive, however, knows what it wants. It is fixated on the object. As an example in which the hostile and the obscene tendency are combined, Freud mentions smut where the psychoanalytic gaze meets unconscious production and its object at its purest. This is also where the third person that supports the mechanism of jokes and reveals the importance of the social links or the social link in the production of jouissance finally enters the picture. Three persons condition the manifestation of an unconscious tendency, the narrator, the target of the joke, the listener. 
Freud makes an important remark that the person who tells the joke is not the same as the person who enjoys its effects. The production of jouissance is outsourced to the side of the passive listener. It is tied to what is heard and to the combination of the aggressive and the obscene content that does not match any need. In order to illustrate this structure, Freud proposes a detailed analysis of smut. We know what is meant by smut, the intentional bringing into prominence of sexual facts and relations by speech. It is a further relevant fact that smut is directed to a particular person by whom one is sexually excited and who on hearing it is expected to become aware of the speaker's excitement and as a result to become sexually excited in turn. Instead of this excitement, the other person may be led to feel shame or embarrassment, which is only a reaction against the excitement and in a roundabout way is an admission of it. Smut is thus originally directed towards women and may be equated with attempts at seduction. If a man in a company of men enjoys telling or listening to smut, the original situation, which owing to a social, which owing to social inhibitions cannot be realized, is at the same time imagined. A person who laughs at smut that he hears is laughing as though he were the spectator of an act of sexual aggression. We can remark here that once the signifier is envisaged as an apparatus of jouissance, language appears as an endless smut. Now Freud's conclusion. When the first person finds his libidinal impulse inhibited by the woman, he develops a hostile trend against the second person and calls on the originally interfering third person as his ally. Through the first person's smutty speech, the woman is exposed before the third, who, as listener, has now been bribed by the effortless satisfaction of his own libido. Smut lacks the, the formal conditions of a joke, while a joke would make a long detour in order to mask the sexual insinuation with a, with a sophisticated metaphor, smut openly talks about sexuality. The uttering of an undisguised nudity gives the first person enjoyment and makes the third person laugh. Here Freud very quickly discovers that smut leads to the very core of social segregation. For Freud, who speaks here as a sincere bourgeois, the satisfaction through smut characterizes the common man, while in the upper classes smut is tolerated only on the condition that it appears as a joke, with a complex codification of obscene content through condensation and displacement. In smut we encounter the zero level of metaphor and metonymy, while in refined social circle circles smut is transformed into an illusion into an illusion. The common point between smut and joke nevertheless remains the satisfaction of the drive in face of an obstacle. They circumvent this obstacle and in that way draw pleasure from a source which the obstacle had made inaccessible. The social context shows that the first case, the use of smut among the common men, only apparently differs from its sophistication in the upper classes. The inhibition of the drive is not weaker among the workers and the peasants. When Freud inclines or yeah, when Freud inclines to the conclusion that the common man is one step closer to the satisfaction and that he enjoys more than the upper classes, he repeats a typical bourgeois prejudice. Yet he also shows that the inhibition is structural and that both smut and jokes are conditioned by the discrepancy between the need and the demand pleasure and jouissance, usefulness and uselessness. If we imagine a situation in which the narrator is confronted with the object of smut, the conditions of the production of jouissance are abolished. What the narrator confronts in this case is castration. He can enjoy only through the third person, which introduces the dimension of the other, where the linguistic equivocity produces the narrator's own pleasure gain in the listener. There is no difference between the upper and the lower classes as far as their relation to jouissance is concerned. In both cases, sexuality and violence need to be masked in order to support the production of jouissance. Even if this masquerade means that sexuality is masked into sexuality and violence into violence, as in the case of smut. Smut is no respect Smut is in no respect more authentic from a sophisticated joke. It merely shows that the immediate addressing of sexuality, the obscenity of the smut, 
masks the impossibility of immediate satisfaction because sexuality does not correspond to any need. Lacan's axiom, there is no sexual relation, implies precisely that there is no sexual need. Sexuality is the field where the production of jouissance takes place. The procreation use value of sexuality is mere fiction. For this reason, the superego too does not prohibit enjoyment, it demands it. And when Lacan proposes his minimal prosopopoeia of the superego, enjoy, he actually spells out the echo of capitalist imperatives in the mental apparatus, the obscenity of the capitalist superego. The unsatisfiable demand for more, for the constant and uninterrupted production of surplus emerges from the gap in the other, which points to the cut between use value and exchange value that the commodity form imposes on every object in the capitalist universe, or to formulate it with the main economic lesson of Freud's analysis of humor. The pleasure in jokes does not mean that some, lo some lost jouissance is regained and the gap between the subject and the object is abolished, but that jouissance is produced on the background of a structural impossibility of satisfaction. Freud's crucial political insight was that every social order builds on libidinal economy. Consequently, an important part of efficiency of capitalism derives from the fact that it successfully mobilizes the structural deadlocks of libidinal economy, the infamous inexistence of sexual relation, and transforms them in the source of profit. Because its logic of production is coupled to the to the desired and the drive to the desire and the drive. It makes little sense, from the psychoanalytic point of view, to insist that capitalism represses sexuality, desire, or drive. Quite the contrary, the capitalist mode of production seems to be the first social and economic system in history that created ideal conditions for the social realization. No wonder, then, that Freud found in the relation between, co between capital and labor the best illustration possible for the unconscious mode of production. Capitalism stretches its consequences in the unconscious, but this does not imply that capitalism is the unconscious.